Hi, this is the Tropical Tidbit for Wednesday evening, July 10th. As always, the thoughts here are just mine, and in making decisions, you should consult the National Hurricane Center, your local NWS office, and your local emergency management officials for the best information that's pertinent to your location. We're continuing to track a disturbance in the Gulf of Mexico that is now being called Potential Tropical Cyclone 2. That just means that NHC is issuing advisories on a system that has not yet become a tropical cyclone, but is expected to do so soon and impact land within a couple of days which the system is expected to do both of those things. So we do have advisories, and I'll show you that at the end of the video. Uh, on visible floater right now, though, uh, you can see that a broad circulation is evident to the eye uh, with the clouds that are seen here. Now, most of these clouds that you're able to see are mid-level, and we have had this mid-level rotation south of 28 north all day. The low level or near surface flow has been rather chaotic and evolving rapidly throughout the day. We started off the morning with a low level uh, vorticity maximum up near the Florida Panhandle. That has since dissolved and what we're left with is a broad chaotic structure within this region here which I'm going to walk you through. Uh, one thing that we can see is the westerlies coming into the southwest quadrant here. You can see what are now east-southeasterlies in this region. These were south-southwesterlies earlier in the day, and just within the last few hours, these have backed substantially to east-southeasterly winds. That tells you that there is pressure lowering going on in this region somewhere. Uh, we can also see some mesoscale features. There's a little bit of a spinner right here. It's going to be hard for you to see on the video, but there's a little bit of a vorticity maximum right here coming out of an old convective cluster. We can actually see this on the recon data from earlier today. The flight that's been around in the last few hours found just a little bit of spin right here a couple of hours ago. That came north a little bit on the floater and you can see that there. That's just a little mesovortex rotating within the broader circulation. Uh, the center of action is probably going to be closer to here. This convective cluster uh, along 88 West has been persistent throughout the day and again the recon plane did find a little bit of turning of the wind right where that convective clump is a few hours ago so it'll be interesting to see uh, how much vorticity is able to focus in here. One little awkward feature of the surface wind field right now is there's actually a lot of northwesterly wind coming off the mouth of the Mississippi River at the surface. You can see this on the recon data right in here, north-northwest wind. Uh, coming right into uh, this convective clump and again you have east southeast wind here now and you have southwest wind down here and uh, this northwest flow is a little bit awkward and the reason it's there is because there was a, an old MCS uh, convective complex this morning over Louisiana that then died all of those cool downdrafts hit the ocean surface and expanded outward and so we're, we're having a little bit of a burst of wind out of the northwest due to that collapsing convective complex and you can see the rotating mid-level vortex left over from that as well. So the flow in the northwest quadrant here is just, just a little bit awkward, but that's going to change overnight. That convective complex is now gone, and this will eventually change into a more circular-looking flow field by tomorrow morning. In the interim, this northwestern burst of air may actually help to spin up a, a little bit of a vortex here in the overnight hours. We'll have to see. There's also stable air behind this, though, that could get entrained. So there's competing factors at work. Ultimately, it shouldn't be a big deal. By morning, that impact will be gone, and we'll be left with something pretty circular looking and we could see a developing tropical storm uh, even by the time the sun rises tomorrow morning given current trends. If you look at the water vapor loop, we'll see that outflow cirrus is beginning to expand over a wide area here, both to the southeast and to the northwest. And if we outline the upper level ridge, we'll see that it's a little bit offset. There's northerly flow coming out of Alabama, kind of over top of the region where the storm is trying to develop. This is the beginnings of some of that northerly shear. That's probably not going to impact development that much, but it could impact the peak intensity of future berry prior to landfall, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. On this loop, we can also see some of the large-scale steering features that will determine Barry's track. We have a big ridge over the Rockies in here, this broad-scale clockwise rotation. This is the ridge that's trying to nose out over the Great Plains and bring northeasterly flow that drags the system underneath of the ridge toward the west. Uh, but the eastern flank of this ridge is getting eroded by this shortwave trough that you can see in here moving into the Great Lakes region that's weakening the eastern side of this ridge. That's actually a little less important important than the cold front that's associated with that shortwave trough, which is currently over Kansas, propagating
rotating southeastward. And this is going to become very relevant very quickly because of how it modifies the low level steering flow. We can see that here on the GFS forecast at 700 millibars valid on Friday morning. We can see that Barry is here south of Louisiana. We have our big uh, Rockies Ridge over here in the mid levels. And then we have our front at 700 millibars showing up over southeastern Arkansas. And uh, this is an important front because it's setting the edge of this ridge off to the west of where Barry exists. So you have northwest flow behind the front, but ahead of the front, you have a southwesterly influence on the environmental flow. And with the front situated such as it is, this is trying to drag Barry basically due north into eastern Louisiana if the storm hasn't gotten farther west than this by this point. And this is what the GFS has been trying to show in recent runs and some other models are beginning to join it and shifting a little bit farther east because of the presence of this front extending into northern Louisiana just allowing the storm to drift northward. It's still a difficult forecast because we have a competing steering flow aloft. If we go up a level from 700 to 500 millibars, which is farther up, you can see that front doesn't really exist up here anymore. We have a ridge that extends in the mid-levels farther over to the east aloft, and that is trying to block Barry's progress northward and trying to force it farther west first, because this mid-level flow is more out of the north and east. And so there is still competing steering flow, which I talked about more in last video. You can look at that if you want. And uh, it's difficult to know which steering layer wins the tug of war and how soon uh, the storm actually comes north. But there's been a little bit of a tendency today for some of the models to come a little bit farther east. The consensus is still somewhere from western to eastern Louisiana, Louisiana in general being kind of the focus here in the most likely area where landfall could occur. It doesn't mean that the door is necessarily shut on a track toward Texas. I do think it is less likely today than it was yesterday, uh, but there are still models that show this track. However, those models tend to have Barry or future Barry a little bit farther west than it currently is during its development stage and moving west a little bit faster and getting underneath of this ridge quicker, which allows it to get to Texas without feeling the influence of the front underneath quite as much. Uh, some of the more realistic models are slower at getting Barry westward and it is able to feel the influence of the front more and come north quicker either into west central or eastern Louisiana. So that seems to become to be becoming a little bit more likely today. And you can kind of see some of the model spread if we just look at the European ensemble spread from Weather Nerds Matt Underlandy's site. You can see some of the ensemble tracks from the 12Z uh, that has a mean track into central Louisiana with spread on either side, some as far east as New Orleans, some as far west as the Texas LA border and a couple of rogue tracks still into Texas. There's a lot fewer members going this route than we had yesterday. And so again, some of the shifting today has been more toward the right and focusing more on central Louisiana in general. And the official forecast has followed suit with this, uh, showing a, a track basically taking the consensus of the models, maybe a little left of the consensus this evening, but it may shift a little bit more to the right later, uh, into west central Louisiana. Uh, and you can see that landfall currently expected sometime during the day Saturday at hurricane strength. That's what the letter H means. And speaking of intensity, we got to talk about that a little bit. The fact that the steering flows are going to be competing with one another again means there's going to be northerly shear by definition. And some models uh, show the storm being more susceptible to this than others. This is the GFS forecast again for Friday morning. The surface center is marked by the red L. The mid-level wind barbs show that the mid-level center is offset from the surface center due to that shear, highly tilted vortex. The relative humidity field here shows all the green moisture is off to the southeast. The northwest quadrant is basically dry. This would be a pretty weak storm in in general, not hurricane strength on the GFS. This would be an example of future Barry struggling to intensify because of this shear, because of maybe some dry air from behind the front leaking in to the circulation and being pushed in by the shear. However, the Gulf is very warm and enough convection can allow uh, some tropical storms to fight shear with greater efficiency than others and some storm structures are more susceptible to tilting over than others based on storm size, etc. And some models do indicate that future Barry may have a better opportunity to strengthen than the GFS suggests. For example, the HWARF model for the same time shows a much more robust hurricane strength storm that is vertically stacked, not sheared, 
and is strengthening rapidly uh, prior to landfall. Now it's not at all clear yet because we don't have the storm formed. It's still kind of a broad mess which one of these is more likely but I will say there is potential for the storm to be intensifying at a decent pace as it nears the coast. There is enough favorable conditions in the Gulf of Mexico for that to happen despite some of the shear that is expected. And right now the official forecast is kind of taking the middle route of these two extremes between a weak and a super strong storm and is expecting currently a hurricane with winds of about 85 miles per hour at landfall. That could change up or down. We don't know the details until the storm actually forms, which is expected sometime tomorrow, probably by tomorrow morning. But the bigger story here is that the wind is not the biggest problem. Regardless of the exact intensity of this hurricane, the biggest problems are going to be water related for Louisiana. One of those is going to be storm surge due to southerly flow on the eastern side of the storm, pushing water up uh, the coastline and up the Mississippi River, which is currently in flood stage already, and uh, backing up the river by pushing water up from the ocean is uh, going to be a potential cause for flooding concerns, in addition to all the inland rainfall that will fall near and east of the track when the storm comes ashore. Lots of rain is expected. Because of the competing steering flows that we talked about, the storm will not be moving very quickly, and a slow-moving storm means a lot of water comes out of it over the same area. So we're talking about a lot of rain here, a lot of potential for flooding. Again, fresh water loading up the Mississippi River, as, long, as well as the storm surge pushing the river, backing it up from the ocean side could lead to flooding around the Mississippi, but also in general, too much water in any other area, river or not, can lead to inland flooding, and that's often an overlooked danger that should not be taken lightly, regardless of how strong the winds are with future Barry. But of course, if it does become a hurricane, localized wind impacts along the coast and inland for power outages will of course be a concern as well. So that's the current state of things. Again, potential tropical cyclone 2 becoming better organized as we speak tonight, likely to become a tropical depression or tropical storm as early as tomorrow morning, and meander around south of Louisiana before turning north at some point. How soon that turn happens, whether it's over eastern Louisiana, western Louisiana, maybe even a track farther west, still some question marks, but the focus seems to be uh, getting more confident on Louisiana somewhere and uh, rain is guaranteed to be a problem. Stay tuned to your local uh, National Weather Service office for details on what to expect in your area and your local emergency management officials for details on your flooding risk uh, where you live as well. That's it for tonight. Thanks for watching.